We're going to pick up in verse 14 as we continue to look at the tragic event known as the fall. Last week, we detailed the temptation by the serpent and the eating by Adam and Eve of the forbidden tree, while today we see the effects of that choice, the consequences of those disobedient actions, not only for Adam and Eve, but for all humanity. This evening, we look at the judgments by God, also commonly referred to as curses, which looking around, we can s- kind of clearly see that that's, that's the case, right? I mean, think about it. Um, never before this day that we're talking about here was there sin, evil, fear, shame, fig leaves, remember, <laughs> or the blame game. It's the woman, it's the devil, right? Never before. Before this, th- there was no hate, no war, no murder, no substance abuse, no physical abuse. No perversion, no immorality, no idolatry, no marriage problems, or hardships, or suffering in any way. But all that changed the destructive day in the garden when sin entered into this world. And and since then, life and this world, for that matter, have been affected. You know, before Genesis 3, none of that. But from this point on, the list of difficulties and troubles goes on and on and on and on and on and on. It's such a fun chapter we're looking at today, right? But even though it's, it's true that this is an extremely devastating chapter, we do get to see how good and how caring God is. Because in this tragic chapter, we get a glimpse of hope. In this chapter, we are given the very first prophecy of the coming Savior of the world, who we are told here will totally defeat Satan the evil one, the serpent of old. And as later scriptures indicate, this one coming is the one who who one day will fix everything. (laughs) I I love it. Right here, when God is judging, bringing curses, we read of hope. And hope has a name. Someone say his name. In fact, everyone say his name. Thank you. You know, I'm so grateful that uh, what takes place in in the world today is not the end of the story, aren't you? (laughs) And it's not the end because this, God's word, declares, a, declares that it's not. That it t- God's word tells us one day our Father's kingdom will come, His will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And that's when King Jesus returns in glory and reigns in pure righteousness. That's a promise, a promise we believe, amen? But you know what? That's not all of the good news in chapter 3. <laughs> There's more. There's more good news in this heartbreaking chapter. And at the end of it, though man is fallen and in a a state where he only deserves judgment and condemnation, we read about a beautiful act of God's forgiveness that foreshadows the essential sacrifice of our Lord Jesus, showing us God's heart and his willingness to pay the price for our sin, to restore the broken relationship between God and man, which is what God desires, that restored relationship. So yes, Genesis chapter 3 is tragic. On one hand, but on the other, it's one that can encourage us as it looks forward to hope and joy and the promise of forgiveness found in our good and caring God. You guys ready to get into it? <laughs> Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your love. I just pray, God, that your, your, your Holy Spirit, Lord, I, I, believe, I believe you're here. I, I pray that your sp- Spirit would fall afresh upon us. I pray that as, as we do look at this uh, devastating situation and the judgments that that are coming, or that we experience today. Lord, I pray that we would keep our eyes set upon you, and that we would know, Lord, that in the end, and even now, you win. And Lord, we win, because we are on your team. We belong to you. So work in this place. Do great and awesome things. In Jesus' name, amen. Genesis chapter 3, we will begin in verse 14, but real quick to remind you, the whole temptation by the serpent occurred Eve was deceived while Adam willingly ate. They realized they were naked, covered themselves with those spiky fig leaves, ouch, right, and tried to hide from God. And of course, that didn't work. And though God gives them a chance to come clean, Adam, you remember, he shifts the blame by saying, the woman you gave me, right? She gave me the fruit and I ate. While Eve says, the serpent deceived me and I ate. All recent movement in the midst of the, at that time. But then we are brought to God and what he has to say to all of them. So pick up in verse 14, and we'll read to verse 19. It says, So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle 
and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. Interesting. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. For dust you are and to dust you shall return. Ouch, right? <laughs> Again, it's like, Adam and Eve, you really, you had to do this. You had a forest of the most luscious fruit trees, all of them pleasant to the sight and good for food. I believe cherry pie tasting cherries this big, right? But you had to eat that one. You had to eat it, didn't you? And yet what is done is done. And because of it, we read of the dire consequences to their lives and ours. But first, God begins with the evil tempter. Revelation 12, 9, the serpent of old called the devil and Satan. Satan, the adversary, devil, slanderer, who deceives the whole world. He started deceiving in the garden and continues to deceive to this day. But because he did what he did in the garden, he will face some deserved punishments. Look again at verse 14 and 15. It says, So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle, and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. You know, unlike what God did with Adam and Eve, notice God doesn't ask slithering serpent Satan, Satan any questions, does he? There's no, where are you, Satan? There's no, what have you done, Satan? There's no chance to come clean and confess himself before the Lord. And that's because Satan already made his choice. Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, Satan rebelled. Because of it, he's fallen and cast down from that magnificent place he once was in. His position as a top angelic being has been dealt with by God. And in addition to the, to the Isaiah and Ezekiel passages, Jesus confirms this in Luke 10:18. When he said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. But here we are told that in addition to that, because of his evil acts in the garden, more judgment is coming his way. And the judgment actually starts with the creature he inhabited or disguised himself as. Look at verse 14. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And here we have a good reason to go like this every time we see a gnarly, slithering snake, right? <laughs> Which I still can't understand how some of you like snakes. You know, as we read, serpents are the most cursed creatures on the planet. Let me ask you, how do you snake lovers feel about them now? <laughs> well, you can, you can do what you want with them, but me, Indiana Jones, and all the sane people here will continue to stay as far away from snakes as possible. Thank you very much. But so fascinating, this verse shows us that serpents were not always slithering on their bellies. You notice that? Th th that was part of the judgment. Now, does that mean that, that serpents once had arms and legs? And did they all of a sudden, like, <laughs> disappear at that moment? I don't know. Or were they, you know, always like a, like a snake, but did they, like, could they bounce on their tails? <laughs> I don't know, like, tigger, tigger, they bounce, they bounce, right? <laughs> I don't know, like a pogo stick and travel that way? I don't know. But it, it's clear, what, it wasn't until the curse were they forced to move on their bellies, eating dust all the days of their lives, as verse 14 states. And it's super interesting to think about. I, you know, as I mentioned last week, some interpret serpent as shining one. So maybe th this, this creature was radiating. It had this magnificent radiating glow, this creature. You know, maybe when it was having the conversation with Eve there in the garden, when that took place, but right after the fall, in an instant, 
The creature could have been transformed into the bone-chilling, hissing, dirt-eating reptile that most of us normal people despise today. You know, I do wonder what Adam and Eve must have thought as they were most likely right there looking on when God judged the serpent. I mean, I could picture their face like, ew, when <laughs> it turned transformed, and possibly like shivering when this thing became the most cursed of all creatures. And I'm pretty confident they never had a pet snake for little Cain and Abel after this moment. No way. And more of a reason that I will never have one for my kids either. But, but God judges the serpent creature itself in verse 14, and then turns his attention to Satan in verse 15, where we do find the very first prophetic promise of a coming Savior and his defeat of Satan. Look at this. God says to Satan, he says, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. I mean, we got to love this, right? <laughs> I mean, immediately after the fall, during the first judgment, God says to Satan, there is coming one who will defeat you. He even alludes to the virgin birth. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. There will be enmity, hostility between Satan and all image bearers, as Satan hates and despises them all, all of us, especially us believers who follow God. But, but check this out. It, it goes on to say, there will be enmity, which is hostility. There will be hostility between your seed and her seed. See that? Women don't have seeds. Men have seeds. There is only one in the history of the world who was born of a virgin, and that was Jesus. Isaiah 7:14. it's getting close to Christmas. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Be- behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. You know, Matthew in his gospel quoted this verse and says Jesus would fulfill it, which would have been taken place 2,000 years ago in Bethlehem with Mary. But here, in the third chapter on page three of my Bible, it says that even though humanity blew it and sin entered in because of the temptation of the evil, evil one, we read that Jesus is coming. <laughs> and regarding the battle between Jesus and Satan, There is no way that Satan is going to win. Yes, we know scripture teaches Satan is currently roaring like a lion, seeking whom he may devour, blinding, deceiving, slandering, and day and night making accusations against us. But he is not going to win. Believe it, church. (laughs) He is cast down, but Revelation chapter 20 tells us he will be cast into the lake of fire and tormented forever. Most of us know this saying, what is it? You know, he is the accuser of the brethren. The next time Satan reminds you of your past, remind him of his future. (laughs) He does not stand a chance against our Savior. And one day he will be defeated and gone forever. Hallelujah. In fact, Satan always loses against our God. Do you know that? You know, sometimes we think, you know, they're equals but opposites. Like it's a fair fight going on between good and evil. There's some sort of spiritual like arm wrestling match going back and forth between the two. That sometimes Satan is winning, other times God is winning, sometimes Satan is winning, other times God. But that's not the case at all. God will always defeat Satan. Satan does not stand a chance against him. I mean, Satan is a a created being, first and foremost. God has always existed. We cover that. And he defeated him. It actually started in heaven. When Satan, in his pride, he thought he could be like God. But God cast him down like lightning. But we also see it in the prophetic words that show right here that show that Satan will forever be defeated by Jesus. The second part of verse 15 says, He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. The bruise on on his heel is a reference to Jesus' suffering upon the cross and his physical death. But as Colossians 2.15 says, it was there at the cross that Jesus disarmed principalities and powers, made a public spectacle of them, and triumphed over them. You know, as Jesus was there suffering on the cross in agony, agony, marred more than any man, I'm sure Satan and his demonic posse were looking on overjoyed. You know, possibly thinking, we did it. We got him. Jesus is going to fail right now. There's no way he's going to make it through all this. Only to see that Jesus succeeded. And he succeeded when he declared the most glorious 
proclamation to telestai. It is finished. Paid in full is what it means. He had victory over sin, death, and Satan. It, that, that happened that day. And it was proven when Jesus rose in victory on the third day. Hallelujah. <laughs> Satan bruised his heel that day, but Jesus will bruise, or another translated word, Jesus will crush Satan's head. Jesus will deal a blow that will conclude in total defeat. Satan has been defeated already, but his end is guaranteed to come. Which, church, it means that God wins. God always wins. And he is on the throne. He's still on the throne. And God has a plan even today. Can we at least remember that this evening? Let's remember that. I know so many people are hanging their heads. So many people are walking around this world, seeing all that's going on, and they're like, is God really on the throne? He is really on the throne. <laughs> he is really on the throne. He is that powerful. And you know what? He is with us. We need to hold on to, to, to not fear, to not doubt, to not confusion, but we need to hold on to the promises that are found here. Promises such as 1 John 4.4, 4, which says, greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. Promises like Romans 8.31, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Do you know that? Do you hold on to that? What about the powerful life-sustaining promises that we read about in Ephesians 6? Against the enemy. That we have the whole armor of God that enables us to stand. Promises like James 4, 7, that if we resist the devil, he will f flee from us. That we have all we need to make it and God is on the throne, and in the end, and even now, he is victorious. Can we believe that today? Do you know, as I was studying this, what I find so fascinating, we, we need to know this, right? We need to know, this is what God's word declares. We need to know this. But what I found so fascinating is Satan knows all this. He knows all this. He knows it because, well, it's here, written, but it was told directly to him in the garden. It was told to him. He was there when God declared it. He, God declared it to him, the serpent, that he's going to lose. That, that Jesus is going to crush his head. S Satan knows this. And yet what I find even more fascinating is even though Satan knows this, he still continues to do all he can to fight against God. In an attempt, in an attempt to try and stop all of this from happening. He won't be successful, though. <laughs> he won't be successful. But he so despises God, he will never concede. And you know, and Scripture shows us how he's tried to do it. All the attempts, so many attempts he's tried to make. You know, knowing the seed of the woman will defeat him, Satan has tried to, to destroy the line that Jesus would come through. You know, it starts in the next chapter when Cain murders Abel. Satan thought he could stop it there through Adam and Eve's sons. But you know, it didn't work. It didn't work. It didn't work because the Messiah would come from another child of Adam and Eve, through Seth, through that line. We then see Satan try again through corrupting humanity, so much so that there would be a judgment upon all humanity, that a worldwide flood that would take place. But that failed as well because righteous Noah and his family would survive. And from one of his sons, Shem, the messianic line would continue. But you know, the attacks to try and prevent the Messiah from coming continued, even upon the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Israel, the Jews. You know, in the book of Exodus, we read of a Pharaoh trying to kill all the male children of Israel. In Esther, a man named Haman had a plot to annihilate all the Jews. In the New Testament, with Herod, we read of the order to murder all male children to and under to prevent Jesus from living and growing. Of course, none of those worked. God defeated Satan's plan there too. But you know what? Satan didn't stop. After this unsuccessful tact of trying to take out the line because Jesus was here, Satan continued. This time, he went right after the seed, right after the Messiah, as he came into the world, as he was there, as he was grown. 
Satan went directly after him. Before his time of the cross, you know, there would be assassination attempts by the religious rulers and others. You remember the crowd of Jesus' hometown, right, of Nazareth? How they, they, they were so mad that he, what he declared in the, in, the, in, the, in the synagogue there, that they were going to push him off a cliff. You remember that? And then he disappeared and went right through. Satan's had tactics to try and destroy him. But you know, there's another tactic that, that Satan used, a different one, in Jesus' presence. And that was at the wilderness temptation. You guys remember that? We covered that in Luke. You know, all the temptations he, he tried to, to get Jesus to give into, but especially the one when the devil took Jesus up on the high mountain and he showed him all the kingdoms of the world. You remember that? And he said to him, all this authority I will give you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me and I give it to you whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. You know, so interesting, Jesus didn't deny that Satan had the ability to do that, that Satan had authority to give it. The Bible it t- tells us in places that Satan is the, the ruler of this world. He is the God of this age currently. Things were forfeited over to him in, to some degree when Adam, and, Adam sinned in the garden. But very significant, in that temptation, the temptation was not only the, the future coming promise of power and glory, because that was already assured to Jesus from the Father in places like Psalm 2, which, which state Jesus will rule as king forever over all. That was going to happen. But in God's plan, prior to glory, there had to be the suffering and agony of the cross. Satan was offering it, offering the kingdom in an instant, a painless solution. But if Jesus gave in, man could not be redeemed and Satan would win. Of course, Jesus would not cave. He would go to the cross and there he would be victorious. Satan keeps going. He keeps going. I think it's safe to say that Satan's a loser, right? (laughs) But he keeps losing. He keeps going. And even though he continued to lose, he failed in preventing the seed to come. He failed directly with the seed. He continues to attack. You know what he goes after next? He goes after God's people. He goes, he, and, 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 and he goes after the church, which is so relevant for us today. And it's so important to stay a, aware of his schemes and to put on the armor of God and to flee from the devil and, and know that we can. We have everything we need to stand. We need to believe this because he is accusing us. He's wanting to take us down. He's wanting to, to uh, diminish our faith, pull us away from God. And we need to know that as Christians. But you know another group? which I believe is so relevant today, is he wants to take out Israel. The nation and the Jewish people. Deuteronomy 7 tells us that God specifically chose Israel. And you know, I'm I'm sure you see it, there's a lot of debate. And there are a lot of opinions, passionate thoughts right now going on regarding Israel and how the war taking place is being handled. There's a lot of people saying certain things. But one thing I believe we as Bible-believing Christians need to understand is in addition to, to the war we see visually is to know that there is a spiritual war taking place behind the scenes. And you know, we, we've talked about what the Bible says. We've talked about the everlasting promise of the land, everlasting covenant promise of the land given by God to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob's descendants forever. We've talked about that. But scripture also speaks of prophetic fulfillments that need to take place in the land and with the Jewish people. Even regarding the time when Jesus returns in glory and sets up his, his kingdom in Jerusalem, where he would reign, reign in Jerusalem. You know, I was reading one of my theology books, one of my theology books, I was reading one of them, this week, and it was so fascinating. The author wrote this. He said, in respect to the amount of scripture involved, there is no theme of Old Testament prophecy comparable with that of the messianic kingdom. Lying beyond all the predict. Uh, uh, 
predicted chastisements that are to fall on Israel is the glory which will be hers when her people are regathered into their own land with unmeasured spiritual blessings under the glorious reign of their Messiah King. There are so many verses about Israel and them being in the promised land when Jesus is ruling in Jerusalem. You know, I remember, do you remember when we kind of went through the examining the end? Do you remember when we did the slideshow? My one time I've ever done a slideshow, <laughs> the three weeks I did that. I, I look back at the slides, and on the slides, I remember, I go, there were so many about the millennial kingdom in the Old Testament. I look back on there, and compared to the second coming, compared to, to the rapture, compared to some of the other things that we looked at, there is the most regarding the millennial reign. In the Old Testament, I think I put on, I think not all of them are Old Testament passages, passages but there was, I think I put on 15 verses. And there are more than that on that one slide about what's coming in the future for them. There's so much regarding Israel and the promise to them. And church, Satan knows this. And he is and will try to stop all those promises from happening. He will use his power and his evil influence to not only try and remove the Jews from the land, but he will also try and remove, destroy them as a people. Why? Because if no Jewish people exist, then God will fail that it, he was unable to keep his promise to them. So there's a spiritual war f- that's taking place. And, and you know, we, we see it biblically. We see, we have Pharaoh, we talked about it, Haman in scripture. But add to that, add to that Hitler and the Holocaust. Think of all the attacks since 1948, since that time. Think of all the anti-Semitism that takes place. Think about what we've just seen, the initial attack by Hamas. But even groups that vocally admit that they not only want Israel out of the land, but they want Israel exterminated from the planet. There's a spiritual battle. Spiritual war. And we know, we went through Revelation. If you went through Revelation with us, we, we talked about in chapter 12, Now, towards the end, the last three and a half years, there's going to be an all-out attack on the Jewish people. Now, does Israel do everything right? I mean, I was in Israel once. I didn't get to go this time. Do they do everything? No, it's a a secular nation. It's secular in in many ways. Some of their decisions were like, what? How can you believe that? You're God's people. Why did you let this? There are those things. But this says, this says, God has chosen them. He has promises for them. And in in his prophetic plan, they are front and center. And though Satan is going to lose, though he will not be successful, he wants to destroy. But like everything else, God will not let it happen. (laughs) He's not going to let it happen. Which is why we Christians, I mean, we are for Israel. Israel. We need to be praying for peace. Are there heartache on both sides? Yes. Are we praying for salvation? We need to be praying for salvation on all sides. Jews need to accept Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. But we need to know that God does still have a prophetic plan for his people that he will see through. We read about it throughout these pages. Amen? We got to move on. But God, God's, what we learn, Satan loses. God's promises are true, Okay. So the first judgment, we're we're towards Satan and the serpent. Next comes the woman, verse 16. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain, you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Here you go, ladies. (laughs) It's time for you you to get really upset with Eve, especially you married ladies and mothers, right? (laughs) And I've seen and experienced my wife pregnant four times. And as we read, multiplied, multiplied sorrow which can also be translated pain, hardship, and distress, I can tes- testify from the outside, not from the, <laughs> from the outside, 
that the description is quite accurate when it comes to the pregnancy process. But this, this first part actually describes the time prior to the delivery, the whole nine months of pregnancy and sorrow there, which I believe includes the discomfort, the weird cravings probably, the queasiness, can I say irritability? My wife is teaching the kids tonight, so irritability for sure. You know, husbands, if you're pregnant, if your if your pregnant wife ever looks at you with eyes of disdain and like with a distorted voice and says, "Why do you do this to me?" <laughs> just respond, "Eve did it, not me." <laughs> Actually, let me retract. Don't say that because just comfort her and say, "Yes, baby, yes, baby, <laughs> whatever." But because of the curse, there will be sorrow in pregnancy. But it goes on to say, "In pain." you shall bring forth children. There will be pain in the delivery. The word for pain means strenuous work. It means hurt. It means toil. It means hardship. Again, never physically had to experience it myself, but being there in the room, I think those are good words to describe it, looking at my wife. uh, But let me just throw this out, out to you. Imagine what labor and delivery would be like without the curse. It'd be like fun, right? No strain, all smiles, quick and easy. You know, I was like, you know, one, t- one thing I do with my kids is, is at one of their schools, I get to like drop them off. So I get to like just park, we just go on. That's probably like what delivery would have been like, right? They're just like, okay, next, 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 easy process. Or maybe, you know, they just look at you as you're watching the World Series. Honey, here comes another one. And it's like, I don't know. But I, I think for sure we look at the command to be fruitful and multiply, probably a little different than we do today. Should I have a kid? I, you know, definitely different. But the fruit. You guys had to eat the fruit, didn't you? But let me point out something in case you miss it. Just so you know, kids themselves are not the curse. <laughs> Sometimes they feel like a curse, but they're not the curse. Actually, the Bible says something different. After the fall, after the fall, it says this in Psalm 127.3, children are a gift from the Lord. They are a reward from him. This is after the fall, as I said this. Moms and dads, let's remember that, especially in those difficult days, and do all we can to train them up in the Lord. Amen? But the whole pregnancy and the delivery process has been painful ever ever since the fall, so sorry, ladies. But wait, there's more. (laughs) Not only with the kids... But with your husband, to the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception in pain. You shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Now, a simple reading might seem to indicate that this means, ladies, you're going to really like your husband. <laughs> like, you're going to desire him. You're going to like him. You want to skip through the fields with him every single day. But he's so mean and grumpy, right? <laughs> That's kind of what it reads. Now, some hus- husbands are grumpy and demanding. But the de- desiring your husband, as in really liking him, <laughs> is not really the meaning. I mean, how would that be a curse, right? How <laughs> would it be a curse? Digging your spouse? That should be the ideal for both the wife and the husband. This verse actually speaks of the struggle for power within marriage. I'm not going to apologize for any of this. <laughs> Another translation states it like this. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. That instead of embracing the role as the helpmate and supporting the husband as a leader, as indicated by the way God established things pre-fall, the consequences of the fall means there is going to be a tension and struggle within marriage. Both the wife and the husband will fall short. Both will move away from what God designed. Unapologetically, for the wife, it will be hard to be that beautiful complement to your husband. And for the husband, the call to lead the family with joy and constant care will not naturally be the priority. But we're Christians. (laughs) And as Christians... I think part of this curse can be fixed. Though there's always going to be difficulties in marriage, I do believe if we grab hold of what God declares in his word, in the marriage chapters, with roles and behaviors, 
without explaining them away, like so many do, I truly believe if, if we embrace them, I truly believe our marriages will flourish. I do. What is God's word? God's word is a lamp to our feet, right? It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It contains all that pertains to life and godliness. Can I get an amen to that? Even regarding our marriages. And if you care about your marriage, Christian, read what this has to say about it. Read what it has to say. Don't explain it away. 1 Corinthians 7, Ephesians 5, Colossians 3, 1 Peter 3. I challenge you to personally read it, to meditate it, to meditate on it. Embrace what God has called you to be as a husband or as a wife. Without going, you husband, you're supposed to be doing this, and you wife, you're supposed to be doing this. Us husbands, we are to do what God has called us to do. And you wives, you do what he is calling you to do. And if you do it, I think you'll be blown away <laughs> with what God could do in your marriage. I believe you can do, uh, you will see him do exceedingly abundantly above all we ask or think. I believe that God can heal. I believe God can restore. I believe that God can bless our marriage, marriages incredibly, even though we are in a fallen state. I do believe, I do believe that, our, that God gives us a rib, guys. <laughs> I do believe it. One perfect, one, one that completes us. Perfect for one another. Will there be problems? Yes, there will be problems. Prophesying over your problems. Yes, there will happen. But the curse can be reversed in some ways if we do what God's word says. Amen? First the judgment upon Satan, then the woman, now the man. Verse 17, then to Adam he said, because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat of it, cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you are taken, for dust you are and dust you shall return. And here, the first thing we are told indicates why Adam gets the blame. In, in Scripture, we are told Eve was deceived, but Adam knew what to do, but directly rebelled against God. Then to Adam, he said, verse 17, because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat of it. The whole, it's the woman you gave me, Lord. It's, it's her fault. It's your fault. It does not fly with God. Adam knew not to eat, but he did it anyway, and God calls him out on this and says, because you disobeyed, work is going to be hard. <laughs> there will be great difficulty. Very important. God didn't say work is the curse. Now, remember, Adam was instructed to work, to tend and keep the garden, Genesis 2.15, I believe. Work was part of the design, but now, because of the curse, it was going to be difficult. The ground is cursed, and there is going to be thorns and thistles and weeds that continually to get in the way. I don't know, maybe before in the garden it was like a piece of cake, like something like carrot. It was like popped out of the ground and grabbed it or something, right? And the tree, like the cherry, right? It just comes and goes right to his hand right there. I don't know, maybe that happened. But after the curse, things were going to be difficult. It's going to take sweat and hardship to provide. And let me just say this. I know we live in like the office kind of scenario right now. No, most of us are not physically outside, but we're going to face difficulty in the way in what we work in, in our jobs. We're going to face difficulty. We got to work, <laughs> and wherever it is, it's going to be difficult. It's going to be. I, it was funny. I was like, "What are the difficulties of an office job?" <laughs> I read like this is top ten difficulties of the office job. One number one: insufficient training. Schedule inflexibility, poor work life, work life balance, lack of motivation, lack of com communication. There's trust issues, little recognition on the job, no potential growth, lack of technology or tools to use. And then this one, I think it nails it. Conflict with staff, people, right? <laughs> Where there's going to be problems because people are sinners. So wherever we work, 
Don't complain, Andrew. Wherever we work, <laughs> there's going to be difficulty. But we got to work. And, and, and now it's difficult, and we got to work pretty much. Some of you get to retire, but pretty much till we die, right? <laughs> which brings up death, which is also part of the curse. You know, it's not God's original plan. Death wasn't, but it entered in. Romans 5.12 says, When Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death. So death spread to everyone. And for Adam, who did work in, in the cursed ground area, every day from this day forward, when he tilled the ground, when he worked on the, on the ground, he would know that one day would be his last, and he would return to the dirt from which he was formed. Genesis 2, 7, and, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. God never intended there to be death. But the body's going to fail now. And breath would be gone one day. Remember the serpent? The serpent said, you will surely not die. But God said, when he gave the commandment, the command to Adam to not eat of the tree, he said, if you eat, you're going to die. And here it says, it is well. You're going to die. And when Adam hit 930 years old, I know we'll talk about that later, <laughs> he died. He returned to the dust where he was formed from. Pretty devastating, right? <laughs> but there is hope. And I believe, I believe we see great faith in the next verse. Look at verse 20. And Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Where's faith? Where, where's faith in that? The faith is in what Eve's name means. Before this, it was simply woman. This, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. But here he, he calls her Eve. It means life or living. And he named her that because she was the mother of all living. And that's faith. There's the faith. Why is it faith? Because she hasn't had any kids yet. <laughs> she hasn't had any kids, but God said it was going to happen. She was going to happen. Chapter one, they were called to be fruitful and multiply. Chapter three, even though after the fall, God said she would have children. Painfully, but still she would have children. Adam heard it, and Adam believed it. And he believed that one of those descendants would be the one to crush the head of the serpent. So faith and trust in God is restored. <laughs> and because of it, look at verse 21. Also for Adam... And his wife, the Lord God, made tunics of skin and clothed them. Wait, what? <laughs> no more scratchy, irritated fig leaves. Now animal skin. Wait, where did they get that? God. God gave it to him. What does that mean? That means <laughs> the first bloodshed was not Abel. It was by the hand of God. But he did it to cover sin. Fig leaves were never going to work. That was the work of their hands. It was never going to cover their sin. Only a sacrifice of blood would. God clothed them. He covered them by bringing a sacrifice. What a picture, right? What a picture. I mean, not only of the Passover, but the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It's a picture of Jesus already <laughs> and what he would do, what God would do. Only God's covering will suffice. Verse 22, then the Lord, God said, behold, the man has become like one of us, the Trinity right there, to know good and evil. And now lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. No more cherries this big, they're gone. Verse 24, so he drove out the man and he placed cherubim as the east of the Garden of Eden, and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. 
man, this is, this is amazing. Imagine what they thought. Imagine the brokenness in Adam. When God first tells him, verse 23, God sends him out of the garden. He has to go out. Can't be there anymore. Verse 24, it kind of takes it a step further. He drove him out. <laughs> Which means Adam was probably like, don't let me go. Let me stay here. Let me be here in the garden. He can't be here right now. He sent him out. And then he guarded it with cherubim. So interesting. In Ezekiel 28, I believe a reference to Satan, Satan was called an anointed cherub. He's a fallen. But, but there's powerful, powerful beings right here guarding the Garden of Eden with flaming swords. And you know, this is, this is all pre-flood, right? So Adam could look over <laughs> and he could see it. He could know where he, where he was supposed to spend his time. But he was cast out. He had to go. But you know, it says this, the, the tree of life, it was guarded, which means that what if in their sin they were given the tree of life? Could you imagine if people never died, if we still had access to the tree of life in our sinful states? I've never seen the show, but it'd be like the walking dead, <laughs> like literally evil running rampant. Think of how many people would be on this planet too if no one ever died. But the fall, because of it, man is cast out. But there is hope. And hope would come. Hope has come. And hope is coming again. Amen? <laughs> and you know what? I love it. I, I love going through Revelation and coming here. because At the very end, in Revelation 22, this is what we read. Uh, John says this, And he showed me a pure river of water of life. This is in eternity. Clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God. This is the very last thing before there's one last exhortation to, to the church. Churches. And he, he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its streets and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were, were for the healing of the nations. Look at this. Look at this. Listen, listen, listen. And there shall be no more curse. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. <laughs> it's a bummer that we live in a fallen state. It's a bummer. Things are going the way they are. It's a bummer. We have to deal with sin, that we blow it, that we make mistakes. But you know what? That is not the end of the story. The end of the story is we will be with Jesus forever. And where we go will be this place. Refresh yourself. Look at Revelation 21 and 22, the first part of 22 again, and be refreshed of where we are heading. And what that means is though there's sin nature, though there's problems, every tear will be wiped away. There will be no more pain, no more sorrow, no more death. We will be in the presence of the Lord forever. Good news, amen. amen. Lord, we thank you so much for your love. Thank you for this night. I pray, Lord, that we would, we would know, God, in the midst of all the things that we face in this world, God, all the things that we see, God, that you are on the throne. You have a plan. Lord, we are part of your plan. Even our personal lives, Lord, you are directing you have a, a perfect path for us to walk in. We are your workmanship created in Christ Jesus. You have that path that, that is prepared beforehand that we should walk in the good works that you have for us. And I pray that we would trust in you. They'd look to you. They'd hold on to you no matter what we face, Lord. Give us a heart for your people, Lord. Give us a heart for the lost. Help us to be people of prayer. Lord, that lights shining so brightly for your glory. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.